Thanks very much. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to also pay respects to the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we stand. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past and present. I can't do a welcome for a country because, as Jan said, I come from the Kunja clan of, and I proudly show the Bidjara Nation of southwest Queensland. But I acknowledge the, I've lived here since 1979. I acknowledge the past, present, and future elders of this land. And I think it's always valuable to remember this is the first point of. We're talking about white supremacy. White supremacy came here in 1788. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I think this is the first point of impact that uh, our people felt that spread throughout the land. And I think it's important to acknowledge that when we do acknowledgement to country, but also acknowledge that we're still on sacred land. Despite the buildings underneath, there is still sacred land that we should also acknowledge. and. Uh, I've always been taught that Mother Earth is not racist, that if you respect the Mother Earth and the environment around, she is not racist, she will look after you as well. So that's my acknowledgement. But into the talk now, white supremacy, well, does it exist? Um, it'd be pretty hard to say it doesn't from a First Nations point of view. It'd be pretty hard to say that there isn't. But having said that, there's a, there's, different elements of people in this society. And I've always said since um, 1788 we've had a lot of changes. We've had a, had a lot of historical things that have happened here which aren't too pleasant. But we've also had, if you look at more recent times, we've had a society that has uh, started to jump away from some of that colonial mindset, jump away and start thinking for itself. The problem there is the governments we have in have not changed much in their mentality since 1788. One line I always use is that the only difference between the first governor, Arthur Phillip, and the present prime minister is a different dress sense and Turnbull's got a better dental plan. But intellectually and mentally and in, in the colonial thinking there isn't much difference. And there's, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of evidence to back this up. If you look historically, um, people came to this land with a notion of supremacy. That is why they decided to take the land. That is why if, if you had one person, um, one Aboriginal person who took the life of a non-Aboriginal person during a time of warfare, up to 100 people in that clan group or tribal group could be punished in punitive expeditions. It was seen don't. It was the message, do not touch a white man. It was why, why in 1814 Governor Macquarie declared war. Uh, Marshal Lawrence stated that you could shoot, an, anybody could shoot an Aboriginal person on sight. Those who, were, uh, those who were shot would be hung from the nearest tree as a deterrent from the others from coming into Sydney. Now that, that's all well documented. In recent times, Paul Macquarie's statue got... Um, graffitied and all uh, Turnbull was interested in was calling the people who did it Stalinist-like, uh, having Stalinist-like behaviour. I think he got it right off the mark there. I think one thing insulting about that, that remark made by um, Malcolm Turnbull and um, when um, he was talking about the graffiti of the statues and likening the, uh, the uh, perpetrators to Stalinist-like people was Around that time, we had some very suspicious killings in custody in New South Wales. Malcolm Turnbull wouldn't have even known about it. He knows about graffiti on statues, but he doesn't take the time to know about suspicious killing. That, to me, is white supremacy. That, to me, is a man who's so caught up in colonial mentality, he couldn't be bothered finding out what's happening in the country to First Nations people. If you look back to Menzies, when one of my heroes, the late Auntie Kath Walker, and two other Aboriginal women, Faith Bandler, another woman, were finally got an audience with uh, Menzies. The first thing he did was offer them a drink. And it was Aunty Cathy said to him, do you realise if we accept that drink, you can be arrested, charged and sent to prison for uh, 
supplying alcohol to an Aboriginal person. He did not know that law. He didn't know it. So we have leaders who don't know the laws that are pertaining to Aboriginal people. If we look at uh, the initial invasion, is proof that you know people thought they were superior. If you look at the um, if you look at the writings of Sir Joseph Banks that were went into the parliamentary report. Um, when the debate was going on in London whether Botany Bay would be suitable for a pe penal colony, uh, the writings of Banks were along the lines of, of the natives we saw around Botany Bay, they were fewer than 50. That's a funny statement in itself. It's like strange ships come in with strange looking people, everybody's got to come out of there where they live and say, how you going? Yeah. So it was a sort of sit back and wait and he said, but of those we saw, they were wretched by appearance and cowardly by nature. That, that was a report that was uh, tabled in Parliament uh, when they were deciding Botany Bay. Because one of the reasons there was because of the American-Indian Wars, a lot of people in Britain were saying we can't have the same sort of thing again. So the first thing that was said about was a a calculated thing by people like Banks, uh, Cook himself did not speak too highly of Aboriginal people, a calculated thing to um, demonise Aboriginal people, to dehumanise Aboriginal people, wretched, cowardly. So when, the, the other thing, Cook had already declared a terra nullius illegally by um, planting the flag on Possession Island up in North Queensland, which was in, ha in fact uninhabited, but he declared the whole continent uninhabited on that, uh, virtually by that uh, island being uninhabited. So, but we move along, because I've only got a, a short amount of time, we move along to the segregation area. After the initial raids where people were killed a bit around here, in this area, uh, up to 70% of people died of smallpox. Uh, it hasn't been ascertained uh, positively yet how people got that smallpox but we do know four vials of Majors variolus were on the flo first fleet in the possession of the man who became the ship, sh ship surgeon John White who became uh, uh, Surgeon General of the colony John White um, they disappeared never to be found again not long after the disappearance smallpox broke out amongst Aboriginal people killing up to 70% of them now, there has been a lot written over the years. I, I wrote a, a lot of stuff about that in the 1980s, which was not picked up. But in recent times, last year, there was a lot of stuff written by people from UNSW, et cetera, et cetera, saying, you know, this is a, there's a possibility germ warfare happened in this country. We have no way of really proving it, but it's, uh, you know, if you try and put the dots together, it's not hard to imagine. Um, after some of the, uh, we've got a case now where people are going around calling mapping the massacres. Well, you know, the whole land was a massacre land. The whole land, every, every square inch of this land, there were killings on it. We know that. Um, history has been recorded in such a distorted manner. I come from the Kunja clan. The Kunja clan, it took them 40 years, four decades to get into the Kunja clan. That is not recorded in the history books. When um, my brother found archival sources of it in Brisbane. That's um, Sam, <laughs> you know, Sam. Uh, my brother Sam Watson found it. He was very excited. He said, I've been into the archives. We finally found written proof that it took, there was a 40-year war in your homelands. I said, good. And I said, did you get a copy? He said, no, I couldn't get a copy. They, they've said that because it was found dusty and all this. He said, no. It was in a little box hidden away somewhere and I was in an area I wasn't supposed to be. There's a whole lot of complication. They've actually told me to come back. And he rang me after he went back the next day. He said the box has disappeared. So these people do not want you to know the true history of what happened in this country. Now, we look at how people celebrate war in this country. I'd like to get up and say, well, my people defended my tribal lands for 40 years. But now the historical recordings of that, which have been viewed by a prominent activist, have now disappeared. So we have no way of telling. And again, this society does not recognise oral history. If you look again at white supremacy, we always, when we look at white supremacy, we look at South Africa. 
And I think people will agree with that. Well, uh, South Africa went under apartheid for uh, since 1948 till I think about 1994 um, was under the apartheid system. The one thing uh, when the Australian government, when apartheid was uh, being heavily criticised globally, the Australian government jumped on the bandwagon. One thing South Africa stated to the Australian government, we will take criticism of any country but you because we actually got the idea of apartheid from the late 30s when we toured your country. And we looked at mission stations in northern New South Wales and in Queensland and how you kept your blacks segregated. Now that is something they've got recorded in their history which is not a very well-known fact in this, in our history, that apartheid in itself, the idea of apartheid for South Africa came from this country, this country alone. It came from here. In the 1930s, there was a delegation of the South African government came to this country, viewed mission stations in northern New South Wales and Queensland and went home and came up with the idea of apartheid, uh, of apartheid which was set up in 1948. I agree with you on uh, aspects of Israel, but on that fact, apartheid, according to the South Africans themselves, was the idea came from this country. Well, it happened in the same year, but the idea came in the 1930s when a delegation from the South African government toured Australia so some 12 years before it was set up. That's where the idea came from. And okay. I know, I, know, I, know a, I know a little bit about that history, but all I'm saying is that the, according to the South African government, the apartheid system came from here. It may, have very well, it may have very well had something to do with what happened in Israel, but I'm talking about the apartheid system in this country. And I, I, know, and I do support uh, Palestinians. Uh, there's a lot of Palestinian people who will tell you that I'm at their rallies all the time. As a matter of fact, the May 15, I'll be one of the speakers at one of their main rallies. Uh, we've just... That's what we say. That the group fire that I belong to uh, have just sent one of our young activists over to Leb uh, Lebanon for a delegation of Palestinian people. Uh, this Saturday, I'll be appearing in a documentary that is pro-Palestinian to talk about Palestinian people. But at tonight, I'm talking about white supremacy in Australia. We can very easily be distracted about what is happening overseas. But we, and it's a very, and it's a, it's a convenient thing to do sometimes. Let's get distracted about what's happening over, overseas and we forget about what's happening here. I'll tell you something about white supremacy in this country. Per head of population, we have the highest deaths in custody rate in the whole world. We have the highest incarcerated rate in the whole world. We have the highest teen suicide rate in the whole world. These are all signs that we have a colonial type mentality governing this country. When we, when we have a look, we can move right through history, we can have a look at the segregation. We have a look when I was born at uh, South West Queensland, I was not allowed into the town of Charleville. Despite being fair of complexion, they knew I was Aboriginal, we weren't allowed, and that was in 1952. Segregation was supposed to have ended. No, it did not end. After the 1967 referendum, where we finally got citizenship in our own country, I was nearly 15 when we got citizenship in our own country, segregation still did not end because there were kids, I'd left school by then, there were kids who were told to leave school because they were Aboriginal. What used to happen if the school would accept them in, and some didn't, particularly in Queensland, they were notorious for it, did not accept you in school. The, the ones that did, if a white parent came in and said, I do not want my children educated with those people, you were told to move. You were told to leave the school. Even after citizenship, that happened. It took until the 70s, and by then I was in Bogger Road. Uh, again, there was a form of segregation in there. If you look at Bogger Road under Bioki Peterson, the first thing I tried to do, because I was illiterate, was to enrolled in a basic education course, it was for whites only. That was in the 70s. Whites only in the prison system in Queensland for education. We didn't get to go to the education officer, that was 1970, I think it was 1977, 
it took until we, we had Aboriginal people who were allowed to go to the education officer. So that in itself is a form of segregation, a form of supremacy. If you look now, the hangover's still there. The hangover's still there. Peter Dutton. Let's, let's, have, let's lock people up on Manus Island. Let's lock people up on Manus Island because they're from a different country, they speak differently or whatever his illogical reasons are. But let's have South African white farmers come out here because they're being persecuted. Don't worry about Syrians who Australia is helping drop bombs on. Don't worry about Palestinian refugees who are trying to get here. And I know people have been refused entry here from uh, Palestine. I know families who've tried to get their families out here and cannot get them. Don't worry about them. Let's let the white South Africans come in because they're being persecuted. White supremacy. White supremacy, colonialism at its best. We only need look at last week's Sunrise Program. Have a look at the Sunrise Program. This is not the first time these people have gotten away with it. This is not the first time. They factually get things wrong and they refuse to apologise. They factually got everything wrong. They stated quite clearly, and it's there on tape, Armady says it would be a good, perhaps that, um, another stolen generation would be a good thing if we took Aboriginal kids and gave them to white families. If, you read, if anybody had read the Bringing the Home report, it quite clearly stated the majority of kids who were put into white homes were sexually assaulted. It's as simple as that. Now, I've worked for many years in this area trying to negotiate with docs. They came to an agreement in the 1990s with different groups of Aboriginal people stating wherever possible, and we realised there were kids at risk. We, didn't, we never denied that. In communities, we would place those kids within stable Aboriginal families, which there are, by the way, despite what Sunrise says, plenty of. Extended families or other families, but try not to take them away from the community. If things were very bad in that community, to place them in a community very much nearby. No, what happens is Sunrise stated quite clearly that when an Aboriginal child is at risk, they're, they're, uh, they're kept within that community where they're at risk, they're not. Invariably, they're put into a white family and they're not even close to home. We have children stolen from Sydney that are up in Tweed Heads. We have children stolen from Sydney that are over down in Victoria. And the parents have no access to visit those children. The extended family who might... We had a mother come down from uh, Brisbane who was a, a carer. She was a foster carer in Brisbane, an Aboriginal Murray woman was a foster carer, uh, fostered over 200 children. She couldn't even get an interview with uh, do the then docs and our facts. She couldn't, six months, she couldn't get an interview. She's a foster carer. They said, no, we don't even want to interview you. She was the grandmother. There was trouble with the daughter. The daughter wanted her mother to take the children because she kept insisting mum's a foster carer. We had to do a sit-in at FAX a few years ago at DOCS. We had to do a sit-in to get her an interview. Once she got an interview and she showed all her uh, documentation, she was, the children were returned to her and she went back to Queensland. No, it wasn't a... Yeah, the daughter had committed suicide in the meantime. So there was no, there was no victory in that. Now, Sunrise doesn't mention this rubbish. Sunrise just generalises and a lot of people watch that. And here we see Samantha Armitage, if, um, if people would look at my Facebook page, I'd see, they'd see um, some of the stuff that I've been uh, reproducing about the history of the Armitage family. They made their whole wealth by killing blacks. It's as simple as that. So we won't go right into Samantha, but her, her, her white privilege, and I rarely use that word, I'll explain why, I rarely use that word, but in this, in this context, it's appropriate. Her white privilege comes off the blood of Aboriginal people and she's sitting in a position where she can say uh, total inaccuracies and not be held accountable. That's what I call white supremacy. What happens in situations like this, you've got a, not a lot of non-Aboriginal people went and supported, and this is, I'll get back to my original statement, we've got a lot of people in this country who are starting to see past this. 
they're seeing past it. But we haven't got our lawmakers, our legislators, our governments doing anything about it. You've got people on the streets. That was witnessed on Invasion Day. How many people saw in, uh, our march on Invasion Day? Over 20,000 people, most of non-Aboriginal people. Mostly they're supporting us. Flying in the face of what people were debating two years ago, there were academics debating the whole point that uh, it wasn't actually Invasion Day. And that, that was a discussion that was had some two years ago, which, I, which was, I thought was a very strange discussion to have, that a lot of foreign ships could come in and um, you know, take over land without invitation. They didn't call it invasion. They thought there was some peaceful settlement happening somewhere along there. And that came from an academic uh, point of view. And you know, having worked in tertiary education for years, I, had to, I actually had to have these debates over and over again at a university, not with students with fellow academics. And that to me was um, part of the mindset that's in this country. We've got a lot of people working past it. You've got to remember there's still a lot of people caught in that colonial mindset. I'll ask the question, what, when I first went to university, I was walking around, I looked like I didn't belong. They had my land rights t-shirt on. Could anybody guess what the first question I was asked? How much money are you being paid to be here? I was in my 30s, obviously not from an educated background. It might have been good to walk up and say, you know, something like, <laughs> you started a bit late, but it's never too... So anything. How much money are you being paid to be here? That was rubbish. That was absolute rubbish. And then I had to endure... For the first year, being called quarter caste, half caste, and part breed at a university. I had to endure that. When I kicked up a stink about a man denigrating our women by calling them hot, black, and steamy, I was that far from being asked to leave the university. And that person, I was supposed to apologise to that person for taking them to task. Now, this is not a country, when you're at the coalface and you're fighting against racism day in and day out, you see it for what it is. It's there. The white supremacy is there. We see it time and time again in our communities. It's hidden. It's hidden. People do not realise the incarceration in the last 12 months of Aboriginal people in New South Wales has risen by 25%. A massive 25%. Now, I don't blame people for that, not realising those points. I don't blame them because you're not informed. You're not informed because you've got a media that is in the hands of the government that wants to push what it does. Closing the gap is one of the biggest jokes of the century. Um, I got this uh, when I was with Socialist Alliance. Uh, some of the research put in there was uh, to get the same age disparity, um, the same age level, uh, living um, at the same rate. At this uh, rate, it'll take another 480 years. That's how slow they're closing the gap. So I don't feel, I mean, I feel a survivor at 65. I think privileged I lived this long because where I come from, the um, life expectancy for a male is about 41. So, you know, I feel privileged that I've lasted this long, 41. That's, that's pretty low. But it's going to take... 480 years before we close the gap in, our, in the life expectancy in this country. Now, the, the, the last thing I'll, I'll leave with is one of the most blatant things of a governmental uh, colonised mentality is the Northern Territory intervention. The Northern Territory intervention has been the biggest land grab since 1788. I, the history of it is um, we've heard about uh, communities being shut down and things like that. How was shutting down communities well before the intervention? He was starving out the Matatula people well before the intervention. It came about when a man called Greg Andrews went on, well, it was already planned, but to, to clear the path, Greg Andrews goes on late line and says, I'm a youth worker who spent six months in Central Australia and I personally witnessed elder, uh, the elders of the males in uh, Central Australia 
forming child pedophile rings, trading children for sex. He said that on national TV to that, I can't stand him, um, Tony Jones, who nodded his head in sympathy and allowed that to go by. Tony Jones knew very well who Greg Andrews was. He was a staffer of the then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mal Bro. Ma um, Howard knew who he was. The, the, the person who blew the whistle on him was her sister from Queensland, Janara Garangarang. She blew the whistle on him, she lost her job. Greg Andrews got uh, pushed out of the way but in private industry and rewarded with a high paid job. The fact of the matter is none of them were held accountable for the lies because Greg Andrews never spent one night in Central Australia. Not one night. And his allegations since then were refuted and disproved by the Australian Medical Association and all people, the Northern Territory Police. Refuted his, his uh, outlandish statements. So this whole thing was set up on lies and an invasion of 73 Aboriginal communities was undertaken not by uh, community-minded people but by the army to seize these lands. And we had a Liberal Party who did that while Kevin Rudd sat and twiddled his sums. And then we had a Labor Party who extended it for 10 whole years and called it Brighter Futures. White supremacy, there it is.